Hi, I'm Rich Gallagher from Sweetwater, coming to you from Nashville. I'm at the Gibson headquarters with legendary Tom Murphy, the oh. Murphy Lab, uh, legendary major of guitars. That's man. right. Great to have you here. Thank you. Wow. And we want to talk about the four levels of aging that the Murphy Lab does. So mm -hmm. tell us what we have here that you're holding in your hands. Well, I'm holding here the ultralight, which is obviously our first level of aging. It has our exclusive Murphy Lab finish, which helps us uh, achieve the checking, and lightly aged hardware, but essentially no damage uh, in terms of arm wear, belt buckle wear, and uh, so it gives us room to move from here to the next level, which would be our light. Right. What I love about this, and I, we were talking earlier, I have an ultra light uh -huh. aged Les Paul, is that I almost see it as a platform for now adding my own playing sure. wear to it and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, personalizing it, if you will. <laughs> I, I've said that, you know, take it and age it yourself. Uh, and in that, and, uh, and on that subject, we want people to understand that if you buy an ultra light, you are buying an aged guitar. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't aged in terms of damage yet but will show signs of wear mm -hmm. under normal conditions. Playing, right. you'll chip the end of the peg head, if you drop the case latch on it, it'll chip the paint. Uh, because it's a, it feels like an old finish, it responds just like a, an old guitar would. Right. So if you're not careful, you'll, it'll age by itself. And that's the beauty of it. It is. Right. So what's the next level after the ultralight? Okay, it will be our light age. We start to see some signs of arm wear on the front. Uh, I have a thing that I've been doing for a long time. I actually use the hinge pin out of my 83 S10 pickup. The door hinge pin is a long, sort of spike looking thing that I rounded really smooth. And I sort of simulate a mic stand ding right there. That's sort of a semi-trademark okay. when we start the aging. And it, usually opens up to where you actually see some wood missing there. Uh, and this is usually rounded off and sanded to show some wear, but not very much damage really. There are a few spots which undeniably are from handling and playing. You gotta be tasteful about what you do to them. Can't be too brutal with the, with the crazy tools we use. Uh, it also shows wear on the back not too bad. A few dings on the rims, natural stuff. And down by the uh, input jack, mm -hmm. it usually will, uh, even in the case, uh, will show wear. So that's the light aged. So you're and, really looking at these as if it, this is a guitar that a player took out and played. And yes. you're, you're basing that on real instruments I, per, that through the years you've, you've worked on. Me personally, I could use a, a light aged guitar because uh -huh. it's not going to stay that way if I have a ultralight, it won't say that way very long. Mm -hmm. So this, you can be comfortable playing it, enjoying it, not worrying about every little nick and scratch uh, without it being too beat up and having to pay for somebody else to, to age it for me. Right. You know? So I'm, surely people will have fun with these. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and every guitar has our trademark rolled binding on the fingerboard to give that broken in, played feel. Right, they're so comfortable. Well, speaking of, I've been uh, sitting here with this guitar, which I have kind of fallen in love uh, I'm with. Gonna, I'm taking it with me when I'll I, I kind of think you might have to fight me for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's swap out and you can tell us about it. Okay. We've moved now to the heavy aged, trademark being the actual missing paint uh, of, of all the years of aging guitars and working with artist guitars especially, and collector guitars. Collector guitars usually are in better shape. Uh, that's where some of this stuff comes from. So I made a template for that, but hopefully there's some variation uh, on all of the guitars. But when I see this, I know it's a heavy aged guitar. Well, this one is sort of bleaching out. These hang on the wall in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a treatment we do to the raw mahogany where it'll actually turn it dark like years of oil and, and sweat. But you, you can see more jams and dings on the back and on the rim. This is a trademark lick that I stole off Gary Rossington's guitar. 
I don't know, yeah, it's definitely a mic, stu mic stand jam or something. We call this the Rockstar Bling area right here. Right. Where the, the bracelets. Bra bracelets. <laughs> so that usually gets, shows a little bit more wear right there, a little bit of pick wear here, not too much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and once again, the trademark feel of a neck. Now, neck wear on here is a little bit more extreme than we're doing now on the heavies. We decided we need to reserve some of the stuff for uh, the ultra heavy level. This is uh, this particular piece, which I did a long time ago, uh, sort of has more of a ultra heavy neck wear. So here's the trademark ultra heavy back. Uh, even get into wear around the pocket. Uh, and there's usually a sort of a connection made between this area and here where something pretty extreme. I started seeing on one of my guitars down here, I started seeing these jams start to happen. Well, what? And I realized I was playing with my keys hooked onto my belt loop. <laughs> and I have a guitar at home that has at least this much or more belt wear. And then it's got a spot up here and I real, realized that was my suspender huh. wearing period, <laughs> where the suspenders were, were wearing it right there. That was back in the 80s, maybe. Uh, so then you can see more extreme arm wear right here. And we round the binding off real, really smooth here, which gives you a sort of a comfortable feel. Once again, the rock star bling. There, uh, on some of the heavy, uh, ultra heavies especially, you'll, you'll see more extreme wear in here uh, more noticeable than I can see on this particular guitar. On the darker burst, I don't like to see too much wood exposed in the burst area except here. It's just sort of really ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's necessary in places, of course, but uh, we try to back off up here. There's, there's, there are places up here you, you don't really see them much. But uh, still, once again, pretty extreme checking all, all, over, the, all over the place. Uh, the headstocks, all of the headstocks on heavies and ultra heavies are rounded wing blocks and uh, missing paint. This particular one also has damage to the front. And I took this off somebody's guitar. I, I can't remember who it was, but that looks like their wing block almost tried to split for huh. a second. And uh, so once again, that just came out of my catalog of licks, really. Right. Well, I think it's important to, to point out that, like you said, all these little types of damage are things you've seen on yeah. real guitars. That this is not something you're just saying, oh, let's just beat up this guitar. There's, yeah, a, there's yeah. a purpose for all this. Yeah, and then you can establish a consistency at that level. So if a guy buys one and he thinks this stuff's cool, well, when his buddy buys one, it'll have the same stuff. Mm -hmm. No two exactly alike, but they are at the same level of wear. And uh, we, we really want to get the necks smooth on the back no matter what we do to them, removing paint, chipping paint. We really want them to have a smooth played feel because nobody wants to reach back there and feel a bunch of lumps and, right. and, and dents. Right. And, and that's difficult because we are leaving some finish and taking some finish off. And that's what I was going to ask you is because usually you don't just peel the paint off the back of the neck. I mean, that's not the way it works, right? No, it it no. wears in different places. And, and uh, show, can you show us the back of the neck on that one? And yes. Uh, it, this resembles the, the heavy aids, as I was saying. Uh, but if you can see, we try to leave some texture in the remaining finish and at the edge of the remaining finish so it doesn't just look like it was peeled off and uh, all the way to the wood. Like this edge here, uh, years ago on the Paul Kossoff guitar, his guitar suffered so much, apparently so much sweat damage that it soaked through the weather checking and it's just pocked and pitted the entire neck up to here where it was broken off and then grafted on so you see new here hmm. and the rest of it's just really, really, really dark and not very comfortable, frankly. Although when he was playing it, it, it looks like it just flaked off. Huh. And so some of that is from seeing that. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we, we don't want it to feel, you know, rough. Right. But we've sort of re-engineered this over the last year as we've tried to uh, uh, separate and define each level. 
some of the stuff appears on both, and but you got to ha have a way to uh, exclude and identify each level separately. Right, right. They are brilliant guitars, and everyone that I've picked up, whether here or from the many we have at Sweetwater and that have, have gone through, they're just stunning guitars. Period. I mean, aside from the the cosmetic beauty of the the aging and, and the way that they wear, they're just stunning guitars. Well, well, let me tell you, the the biggest compliment early on when my peers would call me and say they had played a Murphy Lab guitar, God, they sound great, and feel mm -hmm. great. They did not mention the aging, and that does not hurt my feelings at all. Yeah. Because, let me just tell you that most people know how connected I am to the historic Les Paul from 93 till now. The guitars have never been as good as they are now. They've always been good. Mm -hmm. But if you want a vintage feel, look, and sound of a Les Paul, it's the, it's the historic. Right. And uh, I don't design the guitars anymore. I don't work on the guitars. I work on the, on the finishes. But what a great playground, like I said. Yeah. If the other stuff wasn't so consistent and authentic, it wouldn't be as, as much fun or as satisfying. Right. I mean, the plastic parts now, uh, people will always argue about colors of pit yards. And, I mean, this switch tip alone is killer. Yeah. I mean, that comes from a guy who, first time he saw an amber switch tip on a reissue in 83, ran out to Gibson and said, Hey, do you have those things with it? And it didn't look great, but at least it was amber. These things are really, really cool vintage look and, and feel. Right. And the, the guys are a commitment that has been made by the management and ownership of, of Gibson. They've supported everything that has been suggested that's been needed on the guitars. They're really, really great. That's awesome. That's so awesome. I, I think I can say that the most recent change that I was made aware of is we rounded the top of the G in the Pearl logo because it was too flat and square. <laughs> <laughs> that's some attention to detail that, right there. And, and that's commitment. That is commitment. It's and really great. Detail, right. Well, whether you're looking at an ultra light aged, a light aged, a heavy aged, or an ultra heavy aged, Stunning guitar, it's absolutely beautiful. You gotta check these out. Tom, thanks so much for giving us a tour and, oh, and thanks uh, for the time. Uh, explaining the different levels for us. It's, it's been fascinating. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think everybody understands this. We have not had a NAM show to make a presentation directly. People, them to stand in front of the product, touch it and feel it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a little frustrating, frankly, but thanks for the opportunity here. Today. Absolutely, well, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Okay. Great to see you. And thank you for joining me. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater, and I'm coming to you from Gibson headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee.